I want to talk about some very typical DAC structures that you might run into, um, particularly if you're trying to design something on chip. This is typically how you start to think about some very um, typical structures you might work with. Um, and so typically the, the thing that anytime you build DACs, the thing you have to understand that's critical with all of them, and I will keep saying this probably every single video related to DACs and ADCs, is that matching is the critical thing for getting the linearity, for getting the linearity in the bits that you're looking for. Um, matching is everything. If matching was not a problem, if you could say I could magically give you a bunch of match devices that were small, you know, or, or in factors of two, then so many different aspects about data converters get a lot simpler. But matching is everything. Um, because of the matching, things get bigger, capacitance get bigger, power is higher, and so on. And the fact that as we scale um, down IC processes, since pretty much 180, 130, as you scale down in process node, you don't improve anything in matching uh, from node to node. And so you're kind of stuck. Um, and so this is the fundamental problems that analog designers run into. And when you build DACs, it's the thing that you really, really notice um, because that's like the big problem. So keep that in mind for everything we're going to talk about. Now, if you have a way to get around mismatch programming, for example, change the conversation, and that always is in, the, in, the, in what you're trying to look at. So couple different approaches people look at. One is a current DAC and the other related to it is a charge DAC. You'll see both of these used fairly often um, in, diff in different places. Now the current DAC is very much, you imagine I have an input word here and what I'm doing is maybe I have some reference voltage I get to work with either explicitly or implicitly put into this. Uh, but it's basically going to be a current scaling network that's going to give me a whole bunch of output currents. I can then sum them up because Kirchhoff's current law, and then I use some sort of device, say a resistor, although really on chip you don't want to do that, but let's say you might have to occasionally. You put a resistor maybe through an amplifier structure to kind of clean it up um, to make sure that I get a nice um, linear voltage, uh, voltage um, as a result of all those currents. And what the digital thing is going to do is it's going to create, okay, do I have an I1, do I have I2, I3, I4, where these tend to be all ratioed as a you know, factor of two, right? Because the most significant bit will be the biggest, and then the next one will be half that, and the next one will be half that, and so on. Well, the way this typically gets built um, is to talk about, well, again, I might have my amplifier and some load, whatever that load is, and however I build it. And then I'm going to have a whole bunch of transistors here that are going to be my bit levels. This is one way to do it, which will be either, say, my most significant bit, and then it's inverse. So I have one of a couple places I can put stuff. I either, if it actually goes, it'll go into this line that goes into the load, so I sum it. Or that current goes to VREF, and you might ask, why would I do this? And part of the reason I do this is to make sure that if I have a current source here, it always goes somewhere. So I'm never, like, turning the current source off. I'm just simply moving it one way or the other, one way or the other. And as a result, um, it tends to be really good in terms of uh, transient voltage. I can keep both of these voltages at the same position fairly easily, even with the structure of the amplifier. It tends to make a lot of the things, uh, a lot of the parasitics go away when I do that properly. So when you do that, some very interesting things happen then, right? So then I said, well, I need to create a current, one which is of a certain level, one which is half of that, all the way down to the lowest one. Well, you might imagine start from one transistor. If I put two transistors in parallel, I get twice the current. If I get four, I get four times, and so on. And so this is one way to talk about doing it. But you could have said to me, well, why not just make things the width be double or do other things with the layout, right? Well, what actually happens is you make this transistor, then you actually make two copies of it, then you make four copies of it, and you go all the way up. And the reason you do that is you try to get matching. In fact, it's not just a bunch of matching, but then you try to position them in interesting places, at least given your best guess of the mismatch on the device, on structure. And often around that, you even ignore the devices around the outside edges of it. So you make a bunch of devices you don't connect at all. Why? Because the highest variability is around the edges. 
in the middle of an array, things tend to match better. So that's what you might do. And you're thinking, that's a lot of work, and it's a lot of devices, and it is. It's something to notice that if I want to go one bit more, what, what do I need to do in terms of complexity? Well, it turns out that I need to have twice, I need to double the number of transistors effectively in my entire design. And if I need to go a factor of two more, I double again, and I double again. And this is very, very costly if you think about how much um, in terms of, of what you have to deal with. And you also have to make sure that your original transistor, when you array it, then will still have the sufficient matching. And that may not even be the case. So this might have to get bigger as well. So many th this variability question is the number one thing you pay attention to and sets all of your constraints. Now, a similar structure, which is a little more interesting, which is also interesting from an on-chip. This one's perfect. There is all transistors, current sources. Maybe you have some capacitors here to kind of balance some timing, or it just yeah, this is the capacitances I have to deal with because it's going to increase in terms of parasitics. Here, I'm looking at a different question where I have a whole bunch of capacitors, and now I'm doing something different where I'm going to now decide whether I select that capacitance to be to VRAF or to ground, and then as a and what I'll do is I'll have an initial reset state across the capacitor n times c, and then I can actually, I'm having a whole bunch of weighted elements. Now this is basically a capacitive, for all intents and purposes, this is a capacitive sort of feedback into an amplifier. Um, so if I turned all of these on and this one is in the feedback, then I'd have a gain that's almost one. And so you can kind of see what I'm doing is I'm taking, okay, what is the half part of the gain? but now it's to either VRAP or ground, so that's kind of a full-scale swing. And then I take something that's you know half that, half that. Here's this amount, these transistors, two and one. And so I take unisized capacitors and keep building all the way up. Same things here happen. I will still deal with things on the edges. I'll ignore things in the middle. I'll, I'll deal with making sure they match, but making sure they're kind of in arrays. Um, with some of these structures, by the way, typical structure, if you look at a DAC and you look at it under a microscope, often you can see you can see the structure is really big. In fact, um, in some of the very large structures, you can actually see them with your eye if you know what you're looking for. Um, because you need to make things big enough to guarantee the matching. So the same issues show up in both cases. Um, you do want to make sure you make the circuit topology insensitive to parasitics. So that it's part of the t reason of going either from ground or VREP and reset. You may end up doing some additional things. You still have to worry about clock and charge feed through. This is always a problem uh, with any switch level structure but it's something that can be done. But these are your two classic sort of architectures, which is sort of a current or a charge DAC. Funny enough, you have both voltage outputs, but it's kind of what is the, the core mechanism. You also can do current type DAC styles with voltages or charge DAC, but this is the way that you typically characterize them. Um, and so sort of staying consistent to other approaches there. But these are how you typically look at building DACs. The overall structure is straightforward. Dealing with the matching is your problem.